Hello, BookTube. I've got a small Friday mail haul for you here. One periodical and two packages. I think more mail is on the way, uh, but this is all I have so far. And the periodical has been beaten all to hell and gone because I read it and I'm rough on my things. It's the New Yorker. The new New Yorker. With a, a cover, you, there you've got face mask people going in and out of a subway station with flowers growing to enormous lengths coming up out of the subway station. Uh, and my first thought, I always try to understand New Yorker covers uh, before I get any kind of contextualization. And the only kind of contextualization you're going to get is going to be the, the news of the day and also the title of the painting. I try not to look at either of, those, either of those. I try to figure out what it is. And my first thought was the return of allergy season. Uh, but it turns out, no. <laughs> the, it, the painting is by Liniers, L-I-N-I-E-R-S, an artist with one name. Uh, and the, the title of it is Springing Back. Uh, so it might have to do with with the you know, the, the change in time zones. I, I, have no, I have no idea. But this was a very... I, I, I beat it up a bit, but this was a very good issue. Uh, <clears throat> I want to go through just a couple of things with you, in, in, uh, especially for those of you who don't... who don't uh, take the New Yorker. Uh, like, for instance, uh, a writer writes in... Uh, Sid Arthur Mukherjee wrote an article in a recent issue about uh, COVID-19 and about various the the various infection rates and why they've been so different in some places to other places uh and uh some of the reasons for that and one person writes in from memphis tennessee and says mukherjee points out that the apparent resistance of certain populations to the sars cov2 virus may be the result of a memory implanted in their immune systems by prior exposure to related pathogens uh but you know if you've had if you've had something close if you had something uh, roughly close to this thing. You might have a greater immunity. Uh, but the author goes on, immunological memory could also account for the dire consequences of the virus for older individuals in the U.S., Europe, and elsewhere. People with more years' worth of stored-up immunological memories may experience a cytokine storm that produces a widespread inflammatory response resulting in blood clots and organ failure. This should be sobering for those people who have experienced a mild case of the virus. In years to come, a memory left behind now may trigger a storm in response to an as-yet-unknown pathogen. Uh, so, you know, thanks very much, <laughs> Susie Sunshine. <laughs> Not only do you have enough to worry about with the pandemic, but now, having got off scot-free with, with a mild case of it, could still be uh, something that comes back to haunt you. <laughs> I swear, there are almost no upsides to this thing. Uh, but there was... There were uh, more optimistic. <laughs> there were op more optimistic things in here. I want to just flip through here, uh, and see. Let's see here. Uh, there's an article by Jane Meyer on uh, on the the southern the Southern District of New York prosecuting Donald Trump. There's also shouts and murmurs. Those of you who are not all that familiar with the New Yorker, is their one page comedy routine. This one is by uh, Paul Rudnick, and it's about, it breaks down the uh, the details of police procedurals. Now, it does this for TV, but it could just as easily apply to books. It made me think automatically of March Mystery Madness, uh, where because some of these things are spot on. Uh, let me see if I can find a couple that, that uh, uh, yeah, uh, item number two in the, in the list that he gives here. He gives 13 uh essential characteristics of a police procedural. Item number two is, the detective has at least one small child, and visitation rights are limited to the night he finally captures a serial killer after a tense, violent standoff. This is the detective's equivalent of taking his child to Chuck E. Cheese or a Pixar movie. Someday, the child will grow up, will grow up to visit Dad in assisted living and ask with a wry chuckle, Hey, remember that night we got buried alive and Mom was so upset? <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, wealthy suspects will be interrogated in the glacial parlors of their immaculate townhouses or estates as a silent, uniformed servant offers beverages. Wealthy suspects, even if they're the grieving parents of a murder victim, are always guilty of being wealthy and of wearing pearls, cardigans, and headbands. And they will say th such things as, quote, we'd, we'd gotten back late from the club and there was blood in the foyer. <laughs> uh... And uh, I, I liked that a lot. 
I like that a lot because I'm reading a lot of police procedures. I'm reading a lot of murder mysteries in March. But then there was a great there was a, there was a great article by Jennifer Garnerman. I don't think I've ever read her before, but I really like this article on the Pierre, a, a luxury five star hotel in Manhattan, and how it has been affected by the pandemic, devastated by the pandemic, lay, laying off of ninety percent of its employees, having ten percent occupancy. It uh, brought back memories because for a long time in the in the the naughty oddies and in the late nineties, I had a friend who lived at the Pierre. He lived at a penthouse in the Pierre, so I got to know the place fairly well. Every time I'd go to New York, I would I'd, at least visit him uh, before I made the rounds of other people that I was visiting, and I got to see what it's like. The the, the they have a, a co-op board for a handful of condos that you can you can buy and live there. It's harder to get into than Fort Knox. Uh, but they also have residential suites and rooms. The rooms can sometimes be three, four, five, six thousand dollars a night. <laughs> uh, but a uh, lovely place and heartbreaking to think, you know, uh, there's one of the many, talk about not having any upsides, one of the many things I thought about uh, one, when I was reading the piece was, boy, the the full reckoning of the damage that this pandemic has done and is still doing who knows when that full reckoning will happen? Who knows? We're still taking a full reckoning of the Great Recession, of George W. Bush's Great Recession. So who knows how long we'll be figuring this thing out. And then the great Roz Chast, their greatest, the New Yorker's greatest cartoonist, has uh, excerpts from Henry David Thoreau's secret diary <laughs> that aren't nearly so... Um, so uh, Dude, bro, <laughs> they're not nearly so nature crunchy granola. One of them is April 5th. This whole pawn thing is the stupidest idea I've ever done, and that's saying a lot. I hope nobody sees this. <laughs> May 23rd is twisting my ankle while hiking today. Trees are the worst. <laughs> oh, oh, September 14th is the thing about the outdoors is that 98% of the time, one is either too hot or too cold. <laughs> The, the row that we don't see. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's see here. There was... Uh, yes, what? Uh, Louis Menon did a, a really good piece on the free speech movement at Berkeley. Uh, there's a crowd, and that person right there uh, is well known to me. <laughs> I know all the other names in that crowd uh, by repute from having read about this movement, but that person right there... <laughs> A little bit better known to me than that. Uh, and it, uh, it's a really good piece. Uh, but one of the things that really struck me about this issue was the short story. I have just, I just read this author's debut work. Uh, this is The Case For and Against Love Potions by Imbolo Mbui. And I thought it was terrific. I really liked it. I was, I was always, I'm always worried when I read somebody's uh, debut work. And then I see them get a story in The New Yorker. I always think, okay, well, maybe the debut work had all the polish. Maybe the story's going to show what they're really like, and I'm going to be disappointed. But no, in this case, uh, that, that shop-worn reviewer's pen, uh, uh, phrase of, of an author to watch. <laughs> and then Joan Akrokella did, did a review of the new biography of uh, Graham Greene. Uh, and did it in a way that is very typical of The New Yorker, where they go... Uh, just an ungodly amount of time uh, without talking about the book. <laughs> this, thing, this thing spends four pages of three columns each just talking about Green, just summarizing, writing about his life. Now, this is a, a terrific writer, so I didn't mind that at all, but naturally, as a reader and a book reviewer, I was curious to know what would happen when the, the review finally got around to talking about the book. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a hammer blow. <laughs> I want to read you the pertinent paragraphs. The Unquiet Englishman is what might be called a Monday Tuesday biography. On one page, it tells you what Green did on a certain day in, say, June of 1942. On the next page, it tells you what he did the following day, or three days later. This method surely owes something to the fact that Richard Green, a professor of English at the University of Toronto, edited a collection of Graham Greene's letters. That's the author of this biography. No relation to Green. Uh, in other words, he knew what Green did every day and thought that this was interesting material, as it could have been had it been had it contributed to a unified analysis of the man. Mostly, however, the book is just a collection of facts. Trips without itineraries, sex without love, jokes without punchlines. We look for the beach, but all we see are the pebbles. 
Neither are we given much in the way of literary commentary. That is not a capital offense. Many good literary biographies have excused themselves from the task of criticism. But if we don't get the man or his novels, what do we get? Graham Greene was an almost eerily disciplined writer. He could write in the middle of wars, the Mile Mile Uprising, you name it. And he wrote, quite strictly, 500 words per day in a little notebook he kept in his chest pocket. He counted the words, and at 500 words he stopped, even, as his biographer says, in the middle of a sentence. Then he started again the next morning. Richard Green's book often feels as though it were composed on the same schedule. Many of his chapters are only two or three pages long. This engenders a kind of coldness. And I'm wondering, any of you who've, who've uh, read the book, if you agree. If you agree that, it, that it's, for instance, not, that it's a very different reading experience than Norman Sherry's three-volume book on Green. Those of you who maybe have slogged your way through all of that. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a music appreciation piece by Alex Ross that I, I, uh, I didn't read. I may get to it, but it doesn't seem to be on any kind of music that I like. And so maybe it would turn me on to something that I like. And there was also um, a movie review, a, dual, two, a review of two movies by Anthony Lane. But although I subscribe again to The New Yorker, I don't read Anthony Lane. And never will again until he officially apologizes for including autoerotic fantasies in a review of a children's movie. Uh, he did that in the pages of the New Yorker. They, as far as I know, didn't even discipline him. Uh, they just had, they have caught the virus of the 21st century so bad that any kind of not of of note anywhere, even if it's 100% scathing hatred, is cool. Yeah, we got attention. That's all we really care about. We don't care about the quality of it. We don't care about uh, hundreds and hundreds of readers saying I've subscribed to the New Yorker my whole life. But I'm never going to read the back of the book again because you let this author do this and kept him on the staff. I assumed when the piece was written that he would be fired immediately. An utterly disgraceful and completely unprofessional thing to do for an author I really like. Did really like. Uh, but <laughs> such was not the case. Such will not be the case in the 21st century. I guess is that if you've, if you've caught the notoriety bug really bad, then all you care about is the clicks. One way or another, I, I once appreciated his movie criticism. I used to especially appreciate him as the readable counterblast to, to uh, David Denby. But now I don't read New Yorker's movie coverage at all because it's all him. It's He, he covers movies for the magazine. And I don't want to read, however good his prose is, I don't want to be reading a review of his and accidentally wander into a one-handed fantasy of his. I think it's an absolutely scandalous thing that the magazine kept him on. They should have sacked him if he didn't quit voluntarily, one way or another. <laughs> so I, I had to skip that part. It, it's a little bit irksome to skip some things in a magazine that's not cheap, but uh, I, I will do it from time to time. Uh, that leaves us with two packages. Uh, I don't uh, I don't know. There might be more. It's a beautiful day here, so we, we could get more mail. Uh, what is this first one? Uh, oh, okay. Oh, all right. Uh, this is... Uh, I think this is a double. Uh, maybe not, though. This comes out in mid-June. It's something I'm very much looking forward to. It's a work of nonfiction called Everything Now, Lessons from the City-State of Los Angeles. And it's by Rose Prance Baldwin, uh, who is... I don't, I don't know if he's going to be pictured in here. I dread the sight of gray hair on his head, <laughs> but uh, maybe not. Uh... uh no, uh, there's no picture, but he's, he's fairly was when I, when I talked to him last, a fairly young author and he is, uh, omnivorously curious and terrific to read. So whether it's a novel or a work of nonfiction, he is well worth your time to find and explore. If you don't know this author, pick anything from his backlist or order this, get your library to order this thing. Or, you know, if you, if you, you're flush with cash, uh, pre-order it from Amazon or your bookstore because I can, whether or not you're interested in the subject of Los Angeles, I myself am not. I have found that uh, Los Angeles history is usually just awful. It's usually just awful. It, it you, you go to it, I naively in the past have gone to it thinking, okay, well, it's, it's a big opulent neon city built in a desert far away from any workable source of water or agriculture. You can't have 10 million people living here, and yet they do. Uh, and it's been a sort of a magnetic pole for a, a lot of large chunks of American culture. So I go into books about uh, Los Angeles thinking, uh, this will be really interesting. This will be, this will, 
the writer will tap into this, there was a, a rather famous uh, book on this same subject about 40 years ago that, that tricked me the same way. Because I go into them thinking that, I, and inevitably they end up simply being a slavish fanboy reprise of Chinatown, of the, the stupid Jack Nichols, Nicholson movie, Chinatown. <laughs> it isn't cool to be seedy. It isn't cool to be without ethics. It isn't cool to be desperate. It isn't cool to lose to bad people. <laughs> there's nothing... About... And there's also no good cinematography in that stupid, stupid, overrated movie. It's just a classic example of dude bro cinema. And inevitably, when I read books on this subject, that they get around to that and then they stay there. Like a fly on a beer-sticky countertop. Yeah, thanks. Got it. <sighs> but, but, but this might be different. This author has never led me wrong. Uh, so what, what do we have here? Uh, critically acclaimed author, Rosecrans Baldwin. A compelling and provocative look at the United States' most confounding metropolis. Uh, this book offers a new way to understand Los Angeles, not just as a city, but as a full-blown modern city-state. Uh, America is obsessed with Los Angeles, and America has been thinking about L.A. all wrong for decades, on repeat. Los Angeles is not just the place where the American dream hits the Pacific. It has its own dreams. Not just the vanishing point of America's western drive. It has its own compass. Functionally, aesthetically, mythologically, and even technologically, an independent territory defined less by district borders than by an aura of autonomy and a sense of unfolding destiny. This is the city-state of Los Angeles. Okay, well, I'm hooked, I admit, despite that preamble, I'm hooked. I would have been hooked anyway. I'll read anything that this author does. Uh, but I like that as an approach. Okay, all right. Uh, so, all right, so I'm hooked. So this comes out in mid-June. Uh, if you live in L.A., yeah, then you're going to want to read this book anyway. But uh, even if you don't, you're going to want to read this author. Get to know this author. You won't be sorry. It's it's an old-fashioned thing uh, to be interested in, in a particular author instead of a particular kind of work. But nevertheless, some of them carry it off. Uh, and then we have this this the, the second package here, and it's from Amazon. Uh, so it could be... Uh, an observance of rule number one. It could be a, a gift that one of you has sent me. I want I want all the gifts. I am insatiable. <laughs> so what is this? Okay, this is definitely not anything that I ordered. Uh, this is... Oh, it doesn't seem like a book, either. It looks, looks too small to be a book. Oh. Uh, hmm. Smells odd, too. What, what, what have we got here? What have we got here? A postcard? A bookmark, a little cloth bag. Oh, what is this? You people, you shouldn't go to lengths. Oh, it is a book. It is a book. Okay, it's a. Uh... Wow, it's another blank book. It's another blank journal, like the one we got just last time. It's a... Boy, are, are we are we suddenly obsessed with Steve's journal keeping? <laughs> is that it? Uh, this is. Okay, this is not the same. It doesn't have a metal clasp. The last one did, and it's smaller than the last one, just a bit. Uh, what have we got here? Okay, uh, it's it's got blank pages in these little pre-sewn islands, so you get big gaps between the islands, but uh, but it's nice and solidly done. And it's a lot of pages, and then you just you just wrap this around it like that, and and tuck it in there for a journal. Uh, I'm not sure that these these pages might be a little too small. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure about that, but I like it. It's very it's very graceful. Uh, the one I got last time, I was debating, you know, what to do with it, because I'm, you know, we're we're well past the halfway point of March, and I've been keeping, I keep a journal every day. So should you. You absolutely should. Those of you who are writers, no objection whatsoever, no debate at all. You absolutely should keep a journal every day if you're a writer. But even if you're not, there's a wonderful clarifying effect, a calming and clarifying effect to sitting down, either at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, and summarizing a discrete period of time with your own insights. Especially when you realize that in your journal you can be completely honest. You don't need to, to use the dodgems that we do when we're in daily conversation. You don't need to do that at all in your journal. You can be completely honest there with yourself, about yourself, and about other people. But the, the, the ritual of sitting down, opening your journal, take a calming breath, and then look back. Either if you're doing it in the morning, then look back at the previous day. If you're doing it at night, then look back at the day you just lived. And 
the the challenge is to rest the day and all of its moving parts into a discrete entry and like for instance in this case uh it would sort of naturally be uh let's see here let's open this up it would it, in this case it would sort of naturally be a page that big one day per page the the practice the 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 objective there of summarizing neatly and readably summarizing a day readably because you are writing this for an audience the audience is you the future you the, the the experience of doing that, the once you get into the routine, the habit of doing that is remarkably clarifying and and calming. In addition to being a great exercise in writing, because you actually have a big, sloppy, unruly thing that you have to do in a limited amount of time and in a limited amount of space. A 10-page journal entry is a grotesque overindulgence. You shouldn't ever do it. These things come in one page, and it ought to be one page ought to be enough. And that's for for a writing task. That is an amazing way to get your command of English to do anything you want it to do. Because the day is big and messy. Well, okay, you sit there, you take a calming breath, and you think, well, what are the imports of the day? Looking back on it, what are the things that stand out to me? What are the major impressions and why? Why those things as opposed to others? Also, what little details might future me want to know and likely forget? What's the brand name of the food that I ate, that I loved so much for supper? What was the route that the, the subway or the bus took to get me to the one place I went today. And needless to say, the bigger items, like living through a, a historic pandemic, the, uh, the task of wrestling all of that into one narrative, that's what the one-page entry is, it's a narrative, is amazing. It's amazingly valuable on every level. Personal, yes, if you have no pretensions to be a writer, but professional, infinitely if you do have professions to be, to be a writer. Uh, so that's a, that's a, uh, a call for journal make for journal keeping. Definitely. Maybe I should do a, a whole, int a whole, uh, video on that subject. And uh, on that subject, I now have an, an extra, uh, blank journal in case that's the route that I want to go. Clearly, uh, I mean this, this, I mentioned this when I got the last blank journal, I have been thinking about moving out of the, the big, uh, uh, black sketchbook that I'm using now. I have been thinking about it. It struck me as, it struck me all last year. I used the same volume last year and it, it struck me as kind of unwieldy. Then I got a new one for this year and I was using it. And it again, struck me as kind of unwieldy. Uh, it doesn't just fit right nice and neatly to write in. It's this huge page. It's great if you want to include sketches. It's great if you want to tip in all sorts of documents or clipped out photos or magazine articles or whatever. Uh, but... <sighs> I have been thinking about switching out of it. Now I've got a couple of blank journals to choose from. And now I should see, I should look on Amazon or eBay or whatever and see what else is available. I don't even know. Once upon a time, I had a fantastic journal. Oh, I loved it. I think I got, I, got, I, got, I think I got it from the same manufacturer for three years in a row. Big, thick, 500 pages of blank pages. It has to be blank. For me, it has to be blank. With a big, extra duty, thick spiral. It was a spiral notebook. But you, the pages would never come out on their own. You would have to work to pull one out. It was this big, huge thing with a big black spiral on it. And I don't think I don't think those are made anymore. And I don't know where mine are. I should look around and see if I can find one. Maybe I have a label in the back that would allow me to, you know, go go online and look to see if somebody makes those anymore. But then again, maybe I don't want something that big. Maybe that would also be unwieldy. We shall see. Uh, that's it, this is all, all very interesting. So we got. Uh, I showed you the New Yorker, and I got a blank journal, another blank journal. One of you sent it. Very, very, very grateful for that. It, and especially since it dovetails with ideas that I've been having, which is to move my journal. Catastrophic idea, from a thematic level, because I started, you know, at the beginning of the year. And, and now, what do I do with those three months? <laughs> do I just leave them adrift in one book that I'm never going to refill? I'm obviously not going to put another year in that volume. Or do I recopy them? Do I copy them out into a new volume? Or do I cut them out of the present volume where they're in, fold them neatly, and put them in a, in a recess of the new journal? No idea. <laughs> no idea. But in addition to all that stuff, we also got a book. Everything Now by Rosecrans Baldwin. Can't speak to the book, but I can definitely speak to the author. 
uh, the author is worth your time, worth your attention. So that's the mail for today. We'll see if more comes up. In the meantime, I'm finally going to shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.